Housemate wants me to remove my stuff from the bathroom for her party? Okay, will do. My housemate, with whom I've been renting a room for three months, is having a party today. She did not invite me to attend the party and informed me through a text message a few days ago. In the text, she recommended that I either work overtime or go out with my friends, stating it was for my own happiness. She also gave other recommendations such as keeping my cats locked in my bedroom all day, removing my coffee maker and dish towels from the kitchen, and taking my possessions from the shared bathroom to my bedroom if I didn't want them touched. She has been disrespectful in the past, like waking me up at 1am on Tuesday when I had to wake up early for work. When I asked her to keep it down, she acted like she was the victim and called me rude. Considering her recent behavior, I decided not to follow most of her recommendations. This morning she asked about my plans for the day, and I replied that I would spend my day off relaxing in my room. This sparked an argument that lasted almost an hour until her friends arrived to help set up for the party. To get back at her a little, I followed one of her recommendations and took all the toilet paper and bathroom wipes that I bought out of the bathroom. When she found out, she was annoyed and asked why I had taken the products. I explained that I wasn't going to provide toilet paper for a party I wasn't invited to. She should be grateful that I informed her before the party instead of her guests finding out themselves. I should mention that the shared bathroom is on the third floor, while the party is on the lower two floors. There is another bathroom on the second floor that her guests can use, but I've only seen someone go up to it once in the four hours the party has been going on. Lastly, I want to clarify that I have not given her any reason to exclude me from the party. The only issue we've had is when I asked her to lower her music volume in the past. I believe her real reason for excluding me is that she considers herself superior due to earning more money than me. It's disrespectful for her to exclude you from the party, especially because it's being held in a shared living area. It's also unfair for her to make demands and recommendations in such a condescending manner. Taking your own toilet paper and bathroom wipes out of the shared bathroom was a petty move, but given the circumstances, it seems like a small act of revenge. It's understandable that you wouldn't want to provide resources for a party that you're not invited to, especially when your housemate has been inconsiderate towards you. In regard to potential reasons for her behavior, it's possible that your housemate has some sort of superiority complex or simply feels threatened by your presence, which is reflected in her treatment of you. However, it's important not to jump to conclusions or make assumptions about her motives without clear evidence. Karen parked in front of a fire hydrant, refused to move, then it started. This is not my story but my friend Adam's. Adam is a retired police officer and this takes place in the mid-1990s. Back when Adam was a beat cop, maybe a year or two into his service. At the time this story takes place, a firebug had targeted several businesses over the course of a three-month period. The fires were put out, but they were getting bigger and bigger, causing thousands of dollars in damage. Everyone was on edge, and the police were patrolling the area every night to try and catch Mr. Firebug. On this particular night in the middle of February, Adam and his partner Rick drew the short stick and thus were assigned to patrol part of the area. While on patrol, he notices a classic Mercedes-Benz pulling up to a house, and a familiar lady dressed in a thick fur coat steps out. He groans. It's the wife of a local business owner that every officer in this town has had the displeasure to ticket for various parking and traffic violations. It would have been fine if she were a nice lady or something, but no. Her three default sentences were don't you know who I am, where's your manager supervisor, and I'll have your job. Seriously, she was a Karen before Karens were even a thing. Rick points out to Adam that Karen had parked right by a fire hydrant. Par for the course. Adam gets ready and steps out of the squad car. Good evening, Mrs. Entitled ma'am, Adam said. What are you doing here? Karen bellowed. Adam guessed that's the Karen version of the word hello. Working the beat. You do know you parked next to a fire hydrant, so? Karen said. I'm suggesting you move it before I write you a ticket. I'm not in the mood for extra paperwork tonight. Listen, you need to leave my car alone, or I'll have your job. With that, Karen storms off to the house, goes inside and slams the door. Adam thought if you say so, and proceeded to check the outside of the car for any more violations and wishing that being a bitch was a federal offense. As he's putting the ticket under the windshield wiper, the call everyone's been dreading comes on the radio. A fire alarm has been triggered. The address? Right across the street. Adam looks over at the building and can see a faint orange glow in the windows on the second floor. He reports the glow. He and Rick get ready in case Mr. Firebug decides to cross their path. Several officers arrive and set a perimeter around the building as the glow gets brighter and brighter. Unfortunately, by the time the fire department gets there, flashover happens, and all the windows on the second floor get blown out. It was so hot that Adam felt sweat form on his face. The fire department needs to get the hoses set up, but Karen's car is in the way. Using safety hammers, they break the windows and run the hoses through, getting everything set up in record time. During all of the chaos, Karen comes out, and she sounds like a banshee that had swallowed an air raid siren. She runs over and tries unhooking the hose from the hydrant. What are you doing? My car is ruined. It took two officers to restrain her and bark at her to go inside and let everyone do their jobs. She actually listened and returned inside. Adam spent the rest of his shift helping with the fire and investigation. It was close to dawn when he returned to the station to finish up. 
All he wanted was to go home and crawl into bed. That's when his supervisor calls Rick and him over and reports that Karen reported several thousand dollars worth of damage. Not only had her windows broken but water had gotten in and froze because it was, again, the middle of February. The supervisor asked them what happened and they reported everything. Fortunately, the dash cam caught a recording of the event. The supervisor shook her head, laughed and said, well, you had nothing to do with the car getting damaged, so I consider this closed. A few weeks later they caught the firebug, a different business owner who was trying to commit insurance fraud. He figured that if several other buildings caught fire, nobody would think he was responsible for burning down his own business. Unfortunately, Karen never did seem to learn her lesson, so she was back to racking up tickets and being a thorn in the police's side. She did have to pay for the damages and the ticket Adam gave her. It's crazy to think about how things escalated from a simple parking violation to a full-blown fire emergency. It's unfortunate that Karen never seemed to learn her lesson and continued to cause trouble for the police. But at least justice was served in the end, with the firebug being caught and Karen having to pay for the damages she caused. It's also great that the dashcam footage proved Adam and Rick's innocence in the car damage incident. Definitely a roller coaster of a night for them, but it's good to know they handled the situation professionally. Am I the antagonist for not telling my former fiancé I bought her dream house? Ten years ago, my fiancé left me, 38-year-old male, just a few weeks before our wedding. We both grew up in a small town and although we were friendly and attended the same school, we were never part of the same social group. She belonged to the popular kids' clique, while I did not. A few years after college, I returned home when my dad fell ill. I found a job related to my field about 45 minutes away from home, enabling me to accompany my dad during his chemotherapy appointments. It was during one of those appointments that I unexpectedly ran into my ex, who had started working at the hospital. In the waiting room, I mustered up the courage to ask her out. Surprisingly, we discovered numerous shared interests and our relationship seemed to be going well. After about a year of dating, we decided to move in together, renting a house. The following year, I proposed to her and we began searching for a house of our own. My ex had always dreamed of living in her grandparents' house by the lake, which was near our town. Unfortunately, due to an inheritance dispute after her grandparents passed away, her family was compelled to sell the house. However, luck struck when, six months before our wedding, the couple who had purchased her grandparents' lake house decided to sell it as they grew tired of the snowy winters. Determined to make her dream come true, I worked diligently and used almost all my savings to buy the house. It was meant to be a surprise wedding present, so I refrained from mentioning my plans to her or anyone in her family. Just a month before our wedding, my ex and her friends went to Miami for her bachelorette party. I am unsure of all the details that unfolded there, and part of me doesn't really wish to know, but I do know that her high school boyfriend was present. Upon returning from the trip, she had a breakdown and confessed that she was afraid of getting married and wanted to call it off. It was an absolute mess. She later moved to Florida and eventually married her high school boyfriend. Following these events, I decided to relocate to the city for an amazing job opportunity. However, I still owned the lake house. With my parents' assistance, we began renovating the lake house. The process took a few years, with my mom and dad overseeing the contractors while I was in the city. Having the house turned out to be a perfect retreat when the lockdown happened. I was able to escape the city and work remotely from the comfort of the lake house. Eventually, I made the decision to reside there full-time and continue working remotely. During this past summer, we celebrated the 4th of July at the lake house. My sister-in-law used some photos from that summer in her Christmas cards. Coincidentally, one of those cards ended up being seen by my ex's cousin, who recognized the house. On the Saturday before New Year's, my ex's mother and sister arrived at my doorstep. After exchanging pleasantries and addressing their initial inquiries, they made an offer to purchase the lake house. However, I politely declined, much to their dissatisfaction. A few days later, I received a lengthy text message from my ex. This marked the first time in approximately nine years that she had reached out to me. She called me an ass for keeping the lake house a secret from her. Her family was now blaming her for losing the house once again. She then requested that I sell it. However, I still have no intention of selling. Now, she and her family have taken to social media, complaining that this is some form of revenge. So, am I the asshole? It's understandable that your ex and her family might be upset, but ultimately, you are not obligated to sell the house to them. You bought it with your own savings as a surprise for your wedding, and it has since become your home, a place of solace for you during difficult times. It's important to prioritize your own happiness and well-being. It seems like you have found a sense of belonging and peace in the lake house, and it would be unfair to force yourself to give that up just to appease your ex and her family. Additionally, it's not your responsibility to fix their inheritance dispute or make up for any perceived wrongs. Relationships end, and people move on. It's unfortunate that your ex found herself in this situation again, but that doesn't mean you should feel guilty or responsible for her choices. Ultimately, you have every right to decide what happens to your property. Your ex and her family's reaction is misplaced blame, and it's not fair for them to portray this as some kind of revenge on your part. Stand firm in your decision and continue enjoying your home. Your happiness and well-being should be your priority. You don't want me to bother you anymore? 
Fine, I'll deal with your car myself. I used to live in an apartment building that had shops on the main level. The building next door was also the same type. These two buildings shared a wall. In my building, we had assigned parking spots with yellow paper notes to put in our car windows. Recently, a restaurant opened up in the building next door. However, their owner, manager, and staff began parking in my assigned spot, as well as in the spots of our neighbors. I had a conversation with the owner about this issue, and she mentioned that she would talk to her staff again, but she didn't believe it would make a difference since they were even parking in her spot. Every night, when I returned home, I had to call them and request that they move their vehicle. Dealing with this situation became quite tiresome. One night, they put the manager on the phone because they were busy and didn't have the time to handle my request. Although the manager did move the car, he told me not to call them anymore, stating that they wouldn't do it again. I suggested that they simply stop parking in my assigned spot. However, he responded by saying that he had too many staff members to control where they parked, and he was confident that they weren't parking in my spot. It was probably a customer. His reasoning was that customers tend to park behind a business and then walk around to the front to enter. The next time I worked, which were evening shifts, I arrived home to find a Range Rover parked in my spot. Following protocol, I called the tow truck instead of contacting the restaurant. Since the first tow truck was not equipped to move a vehicle of that type, I had to wait for a second one. The reason for the delay was that I lacked the necessary knowledge to answer their questions about the truck, which resulted in them initially sending the wrong type of truck. Eventually, they successfully towed the Range Rover, and I went inside and went to bed. A few hours later, I received a phone call from the towing company. They informed me that the owner of the Range Rover claimed it was his parking spot, and that I had no right to tow him. They stated that they would bill me for the tow. I explained to the caller about the parking permits provided by my landlord, the countless phone calls I had made to request that they move, the instruction to stop bothering the restaurant, and the fact that the restaurant itself had a separate parking lot in the neighboring building. After our conversation, we said goodbye, and I never heard anything further about it. Consequently, I was finally able to park in my assigned spot again. I decided to share this incident with my neighbor, who then suggested that I should inform the owner of the other building just to be safe. Therefore, I quickly went into her shop and relayed the occurrence. Much to my surprise, her response was along the lines of, You towed the Range Rover. I confirmed that I did, which caused her to burst into laughter. She expressed her approval and encouraged me, stating that it was the truck belonging to the restaurant owner. To this day, it still brings a smile to my face when I think about it. It definitely sounds like you did the right thing by towing the Range Rover that was parked in your assigned spot. It's frustrating when people repeatedly disregard the rules and inconvenience others. It's great that you took the necessary steps to resolve the issue, even though the restaurant owner tried to argue against it. It's also amusing how the owner of the other building knew about the situation and found it amusing as well. Hopefully, that was the end of your parking troubles and you can continue to enjoy parking in your spot without any issues. Am I the antagonist for saying my dad forcing me to babysit for his wife when I really didn't know her or her kids was a big reason? Things didn't work out like he wanted. My parents divorced when I was two years old. My mom got remarried last year to my stepdad, whom she had been with since I was five. On the other hand, my dad has been remarried three times since the divorce and has been in six other live-in relationships. His most recent marriage has been more successful than the others and they just celebrated their fourth wedding anniversary in June. I was 13 when my dad married his current wife. Interestingly, he introduced me to her only after they got engaged. From what I gather, she may have been the person he was involved with while still married to his third wife, although I can't be certain. However, I do know for sure that he cheated on his ex-wife, and they were only married for about 18 months before their relationship ended. I distinctly remember the day when my dad introduced me to his wife and her two sons, who were two and four years old at the time. Some may assume that the youngest boy is my dad's son, but he is biracial, and both my dad and his wife are white, so I highly doubt it. During the introduction they talked about us becoming a family, and his wife mentioned that her boys would love having an older brother. I wasn't particularly thrilled about this and disliked being labeled as a big brother to two unfamiliar kids. Five months later my dad and his wife got married, and soon after, my dad insisted that I babysit their boys so they could go on a date. The following week when I was at his house, my dad forced me to babysit once more, this time so his wife could go shopping for a few hours. His wife tried to convince me that it was an excellent opportunity for us to bond but I don't think either she or my dad were happy when I didn't actively engage with the kids or took care of them at night while babysitting. I didn't want to do it and I expressed my feelings to my dad, but he simply told me tough luck. Considering the instability my dad had caused after his divorce from my mom and the fact that he didn't even give me a chance to meet his stepkids before getting serious with his new wife, I asked my mom to fight for custody of me. She did, and she won, partly due to the instability in my age being taken into account. Despite living with my mom, my dad made efforts to keep me involved in his life. He tried to persuade me to babysit a few more times but eventually gave up. However, now that years have passed, he seems upset that I don't act like a member of his family or make an effort to get to know his stepkids. 
He recently called my mom to discuss my graduation plans after Christmas and became annoyed when he found out that there were limited spaces and I had already secured my spot. I saw him on New Year's Eve at my grandparents' party and he approached me to express his disappointment about our strained relationship. He even tried to involve my grandparents in the conversation. Then he said, it's like our family failed because I made you babysit once or twice. I pointed out that it was a significant reason, considering I hardly knew his wife or her children, and he had made it clear that my opinion and comfort didn't matter to him. This angered him, especially since his stepkids were present, and my remarks confirmed his neglect. I told him that he shouldn't have said what he did, and he should have left me alone. So, am I the asshole? It's understandable that you feel the way you do given the circumstances. Your dad didn't involve you in his new family until he was already engaged, which can be hurtful and make you feel like an afterthought. Additionally, it seems like he forced you into a role that you weren't comfortable with by repeatedly asking you to babysit his stepkids. It's not fair for him to expect you to feel close to his wife and stepkids when you haven't had a chance to build a relationship with them. Your feelings and comfort should have been taken into consideration, and it's understandable that you would prioritize spending time with your own family and claiming limited spaces at your graduation ceremony. Your dad should recognize the role his actions played in your strained relationship and respect your boundaries. It's not your responsibility to make an effort to know his stepkids when he hasn't made an effort to integrate you into his family in a thoughtful and considerate way. I stole from a previous job for a pregnant coworker. This incident happened many years ago, but I recently remembered it and thought this might be a good place to share. A long time ago, I was hired at my first job, a popular fast food chain restaurant. Although the work wasn't glamorous, the relationships I formed with my coworkers made it worthwhile. One of our managers, let's call her Kathy, had a type of personality similar to the Karen stereotype. She was always discontent and expressed her dissatisfaction to everyone. Her attitude made work almost unbearable, and we all dreaded being scheduled on a shift with her. Kathy typically worked morning shifts, as did I. I was one of the employees responsible for opening the store and preparing it for the day. We were allowed a short break before opening as long as all the necessary tasks were completed. However, we were not permitted to make food from the store to eat during our morning break. This privilege was only given to those who worked in the afternoon or evening. The reason behind this rule was that the computer systems and cash registers would only be active a few minutes before opening. To prevent any issues with service, we were required to ring in our food and pay the discounted employee price. Making food and paying for it later was not allowed, as it could interfere with service or people might forget to pay. The company believed this would help prevent theft. Unfortunately, this option was not available for the morning opening shift. Other managers, on the other hand, would often allow us to eat something in the morning, sometimes even for free. One of my coworkers, Carrie also usually worked morning shifts with me. I quickly became friends with her. She was a young single mother, eight months pregnant with a son, and had an eight-year-old daughter. One morning when Carrie and I were working together, she shared with me that she had a rough morning and didn't have any food for her break. Due to her strict pregnancy diet, Carrie needed to eat at certain times throughout the day. All the managers were aware of this and tried to accommodate her needs to some extent, as long as she paid full price for anything she ate outside of her discounted meal. She was very upset and told me that when she asked Kathy for permission to make a sandwich, Kathy denied her request, even if Kathy rang it up herself and took the money. But Kathy wasn't the type to simply say no. She would watch people closely, hoping to catch them in the act if they disobeyed her. Normally nobody dared to cross her, but this was Kathy. I witnessed her spying on Carrie through the office window, and I even heard Kathy tell Carrie that she better not steal and make herself any food. This situation upset me as well. I felt bad for Carrie and wished there was something I could do to help her feel better. I was also exhausted with Kathy's arbitrary rules that no other manager seemed to enforce. Since I didn't bring any food for myself, as I usually skipped breakfast back then, I decided to take matters into my own hands and get a little petty revenge on Kathy. During Carrie's break, she went outside to her car and Kathy disappeared inside the office. I waited for the perfect opportunity. Just as Kathy became engrossed in other managerial tasks, I quickly grilled a small beef patty and made a sandwich for Carrie. It wasn't uncommon for me to join her outside during our break, so I brought her the sandwich and then went back inside to use the restroom before my shift. While I was in the stall, I heard someone enter the restroom, rummage through the trash, and start washing their hands. When I exited the stall, I saw Kathy standing there, and she greeted me by asking, where did you put the wrapper? I looked confused and told her that I hadn't eaten anything during my break. Sometime after we opened, Kathy approached both Carrie and me and accused us of stealing food. She warned us that we were lucky the cameras hadn't caught us, or else we would be fired. I walked away from that interaction still employed for the day, feeling good about helping a pregnant person who needed to eat. Kathy eventually transferred to another store, and things remained relatively peaceful until I left. I never stole food again. Maybe it was petty, but the memory of Kathy frantically digging through every single trash can for evidence and driving herself crazy over it, it was worth it. Your silent revenge on Kathy was definitely clever, 
and seeing her panic and dig through trash cans must have been quite satisfying. It's understandable that you felt the need to take matters into your own hands, especially with the lack of support from the other managers. Although it was a petty act, your intention was to support a co-worker and not to cause harm. It's unfortunate that Kathy tried to accuse you and carry of theft without evidence, but thankfully you managed to keep your job. I hope things improved after Kathy moved to another store, and it's good to hear that you never had to resort to similar actions again. Overall, it's a story that showcases the importance of supporting one another in challenging work environments. Thanks for watching. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications so you never miss a video. To finish listening to all the stories, check out the playlist in the description.